This Week in Startups is brought to you by NetSuite from Oracle, the last business system you'll ever need. To get your free guide, Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth, go to netsuite.com slash twist. And Captera, find the software that will help you do what you do better. Join the millions of people who use Captera every month. Start your search today at captera.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is the show where we talk to entrepreneurs and investors about the products and services that are changing the world or hope to. Entrepreneurship is hard. Most companies fail. It's arduous. It's painful, but the highs are very high Mm -hmm. to match the incredible and continual lows, which are very, very low. It's great to be back in the studio after a great uh, two-week book tour in New York for Angel. My, uh, it's not a memoir as such, but it's uh, my book about angel investing. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, go to angelthebook.com. And if you want to get the audio book, I read it myself. The publisher was like, eh, we don't know if we want you to read the book. But uh, it came out pretty good. So listen to it on Audible, buy the hard copy. And if you are interested in angel investing, you can go to Jason's Syndicate, J-A-S-O-N-S, syndicate.com. And if you're accredited investor, we'll share our deals with you. And if you're non-accredited, stay tuned because there's a lot of uh, interesting platforms like Seedinvest and Republic that are doing non-accredited investors. So I think people uh, in the United States who are not accredited investors are going to have a chance to do what I do for a living, which is angel invest in startups. And it's one of the most thrilling and fun things you can do. So uh, today on the program, I have Laura Gomez. She is at Laura on Twitter. I'm not kidding. She has her first name on Twitter, L-A-U-R-A, like I do for Jason. And she has a company called Atypica. Yes. Atypica. 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 Yeah. Atypica. Not atypical, but atypica. Yeah, atypica. What is atypica and why did you create it? And welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks for having me. Um, Atypica is a diversity and talent solution that sits on top of applicant databases. So we are enterprise. So we're a SaaS company. We have several clients across tech as well as outside of tech. And I created it after being on a panel about almost three years ago on diversity in tech. (laughs) And everybody kept talking about this issue, but nobody wanted to build a data-driven machine learning solution to tackle this issue. So I decided that um, I was passionate enough about about it and um, founded Atypica, and it's now almost uh, three years old. Great. So now, define for the people who are listening or who are watching the video, what is the issue in technology with diversity? What is the core issue of why the diversity statistics at Google, to, Facebook, to, Twitter, which yeah. I think maybe it was just two or three years ago, they started actually publishing, yeah. which I thought was amazing because I've never heard of other companies doing mm-hmm. this. But in technology, the companies publish their diversity statistics, mm-hmm. which I think is laudable, right? Yes. Um, they started doing that about three years ago. Three years ago, um, Tracy Chu. Um, yes, Tracy. We who is also program. yes, she's a fellow Project Include member. So we're right. both part of Project Include, and she's the one that pushed Pinterest to publish the numbers, and it sort of came out as well. Um, so explain what the core issue is for people who aren't in the technology industry, or maybe they're, you know, in the technology industry but not here in the Silicon Valley. What is the core issue with diversity in tech? The core issue is looking at it as a social impact issue instead of as a business and a business imperative. I think the second is that there's always um, one-sided blanket solution towards the diversity in tech or diversity in any workforce. Um, With us, we we take it as a multifaceted approach that there's behaviors that the company's engaging in or, and applicants are withdrawing and there's industry behavior. So all those behaviors combined together allow for either the needle to move or to not to move. For example, we found that women are more likely to accept job offers across all tech companies, regardless whether they're a couple hundred or a couple thousand. And that's what really moved the, the needle for women in tech. <laughs> so if we were to compare tech to other industries, I don't know if you have the statistic yeah. at your fingertips or not, but how is tech different than, say, finance or the media business or Hollywood or 
the insurance business, is it radically different or you know, are certain groups overrepresented, underrepresented? And what is the cause of that problem? Is it the companies? I'm gonna, so I, just, I realize there's two questions here, but I kind of think it's one that I think a lot of people struggle with, and you are actually in the thick of this, so you probably know better than all of us. What, what is the difference between our industry and others with different uh, ethnicities or groups? Which ones are overrepresented, underrepresented? And then the second part of the question is, do we know why? Is it the fault of the companies for not doing enough? Are there not enough people who have graduated with the degrees that these companies are looking for in different ethnic groups? What's the, what do you think the reasons for the difference in um, diversity between our industry and others? I think other industries, let's take finance or yeah. media, those one are directly impacted by consumers, right? The consumers go ahead and say, okay, I want to either open this bank account with this bank, um, and they're t targeting and they're really listening to my needs, um, and or media as well. Like a movie, as you saw recently, a lot of other female-led casts have done very well at the box office. So obviously the consumer is really... And I think with tech, we forget about the user end user. And so we forget that, you know, filters for certain um, Snapchats um, are not very... Actually are... Don't do well with darker skin huh. folks. And so like no one thought about it there at the table and forgot we become our innovators and creators and we and we are s such in a silo that we don't understand how our products are impacting the end users as much as we think it should so I think the first thing with our industry is to really acknowledge that the end users are really the ones that are driving our growth um, having been at, at Twitter early on I, I saw the growth among African Americans as well as international and catering to that should have you know helped Twitter a little bit more um, as it relates now. And I think on the other end, I think um, there are over representations of groups here, but I think everything we were, my team and I, we were talking this morning that everything's really anecdotal. Everything's like, there's not enough people graduating with this degree or they're not applying and there's no data around it. And we come in and we say, here's the data. We put our own, just received the patent, the provisional patent on our models. And so we say, here's the data before you start acting upon it. So, which groups are overrepresented, which ones are underrepresented in our industry, and do we have an idea of why is sort of the, you know, the, the question I think everybody has. Why, why are Asian Americans and Indian Americans so overrepresented, African Americans and Latinos so underrepresented in our industry? When you, when you look at the data now... But, um Asian Americans are overrepresented, but they also hit ceilings um, in leadership positions, correct? Oh, that's interesting. So a lot, although they are overrepresented in industry, in tech, um, the mobility of managers or C-level executives at big tech companies um, are very few, far and few. Uh, so, so even though they're overrepresented, yeah. they're not overrepresented in the C-suite. Correct. So that shows some level of bias. Um, we are looking this morning, my team and I, we were actually looking at the number of technical degrees by African Americans and Latinx. Um, and so even though that there's only two to 3% of those uh, represented in tech, um, they actually are getting technical degrees at 8% or 10% in some instances, oh, well, and, yet, that's interesting. and yet we're not hiring them. So we have 8% of African Americans or graduates of computer science degrees, you might have 8% African American yeah. and, and Latino. Latino. Yeah. But in our industry, we have one or two percent. Yes. So that makes no logical sense. No, That's it does a, not. A, there's a break they, there. Yeah. What's causing that break? Where are those minds going? Are they going to work in some other industry, and they just don't feel welcome in this industry? Yes. What, what's the disconnect? Because that seems like a six or seven X. Inclusion is a big problem. I Define mean, it's what not that just means yeah. For Inclusion definitely the feeling of feeling welcome uh, or the feeling of um, understanding. Understanding how other people feel, whether they feel welcome or included in the dis discussion. So um, as we move more towards data, we can actually predict where inclusion is really going to affect the workforce. And so I think in sis situations where I'm going to go, I'm an applicant and I'm applying to four different companies. And I don't see anyone who looks like me. So I don't feel that there's an inclusion component and or recognize. So maybe a bigger corporation with 
with opportunities, technical opportunities, there's technical roles in everything from consumer to finance. So maybe they, they are really uh, working on inclusion. So maybe at a big company like GE, yes. somebody graduating an African-American or Hispanic might see more African-American and Hispanic people working at GE or yes. IBM or some big company and say, you know what, I feel more comfortable here. Whereas at a startup, it might be a small number of people and they might think, well, I'm going to be the only African-American yeah. on the team. This is, just doesn't feel welcoming yes. to me. Yeah. There's a whole concept on taking your, your whole self to work. And so there's a lot of underrepresented minorities in tech that don't feel like that they can take their, their whole selves to work, that, oh, we, that they have to leave something behind, um, either a, a part of their identity or their own potential. So I think as we grow as an industry, we need to make sure that everyone feels that they can come um, – Ageism is another thing, right? Like that seems really yes, yes. Uh, prevalent. Yes, it is. Where is ageism? Where would you say ageism starts? At what age are people sort of discriminated against by high tech companies? Because there's been lawsuits. I think Google and Facebook yes. both had lawsuits where people were suing because they felt discriminated against. I'm not sure which one I'll have Emmy Award winning. I don't know. Jackie. I think Check that's that, but. something that we definitely want to um, explore at Atypica. We mm -hmm. want to look at either words of what people saying, I have over 10 years of experience and whether there's a threshold when people list in their resume over 10 years of experience or they list a certain date range that might promote those biases to come uh, in. So having 25 years experience in tech Yes. Might actually decrease your ability to get a job, mm -hmm. whereas just having 10 might increase it, or five. Yes. They might think this person's younger, they're going to work harder, yes. they might not have a family, they're going to work. I want to go back to what you said about not being able to bring your whole self to work. Mm -hmm. give, give the audience an example of what you mean by that and how that impa impacts a person emotionally or yes. in life in general. Definitely. I've been in tech since I was 17. I grew up in the Bay Area. I'm an immigrant, um, but grew up since the age of 10 here in Silicon Valley, right in the heart, Redwood City. Um, and I didn't feel that I could bring my whole self to work throughout my whole tech career, which is over two decades, up until now that I created my own company where I can, because I'm right. the CEO. So yeah. I can bring my... <laughs> you can find your own world. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. But as an so, Latino woman, yeah. you're a Latino? Yeah, or? Latina. Yeah, so you don't feel you could... Be fully who you are and your ethnicity, or else people might. Feel and all all of the different identities. Um, yeah. That's called intersectionality. So I define what, want, what intersectionality yeah. is yes, because I can't white explain or mansplain that term. No, I've no, heard no. this intersectionality. I have an idea of what it yeah. means, but educate me. What does yes, it mean? Definitely, intersectionality is a concept where there's different layers of identities that wow. people have, and that they may be different. Um, levels of oppression to go along with those identities. So for example, I'm an immigrant in today's America. I'm also a woman. I'm a female founder. I'm a solo founder. So there may be some times where I wake up and my intersectionality will be towards being a female founder before I'm Latina because I'm the, usually the only female founder in the room. So I will choose. That's something yeah. you choose. You choose what you're going to feel when you Not what I'm going to feel, like what, what how identity, you be perceived? what identity I want to, ah. to take on. During that, yes. And so you might not feel comfortable with certain, in certain groups, having a certain um, perception about you. Is that what it means? It's not been, being comfortable. It's much more on like um, at any given point, someone will look at me and will impose one of the, my identities. Ah, gotcha. And so um, at that point where I felt my identities are much more important. So when I'm in a room full of male founders, my identity as a female founder oversees all of my other identities because I think that that's the, the important conversation that I need to engage in. Um, when we get back from this commercial break, yeah. I want to talk about um, how your software works and what your key insight is to yes. solving these problems. Because we know there's a problem just from looking at the statistics. But what wins have you had when we get back on yeah. This Week in Startups? Hey, everybody. I want to welcome NetSuite as a new partner here at This Week in Startups. And if you're listening to this, you're probably a business owner and a leader, and you probably have said one of the following to yourself, why is it taking accounting so long to close the books? And we beat our revenue goal, but we lost money. Why? And the dreaded, we're getting audited. Yes, all of these things are a sign that you've outgrown your business management software. 
or maybe you're not even using any software, QuickBooks and spreadsheets work fine at the start of a company. Of course, we all do that. But now there's too many mistakes and delays and you can't get answers fast. So you need the number one business management solution for growing companies. That is NetSuite from Oracle. NetSuite from Oracle is gonna solve all these problems. You're gonna know what's going on in your business in real time. Revenue, expenses, customers, orders, even your HR department, everything in a gorgeous dashboard, on your phone even. And their current clients include people you know, like GitHub, local analytics, local analytics rather, plan grid, and 88% of Bessemer's next cloud unicorns are using NetSuite by Oracle. You're up and running fast, and it's the last business system you're ever going to need. So here's your call to action. Very simple, go to netsuite.com slash twist and you will get your free guide. That guide is called Overcoming Your Five Obstacles for Growth. Okay, and let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey everybody, welcome back to This Week in Start. It's my guest, Laura Gomez. She is the CEO and founder of Atypica. Atypica. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Atypica, yeah. which means what? It means atypical in Esperanto. And Esperanto is that crazy Star Trek language that everybody speaks the same language on planet Earth? It was a, It's the first man-made language, meaning it was fabricated a couple hundred years ago by um, intellectuals in Europe. And they thought that this would actually take off. Yeah, it didn't. No. Uh, it's I, About 50,000 people around the world speak it. But yeah, it did not take off as yeah. expected. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've been talking about diversity uh, in tech. Yes. Which, is it getting better? Yes. It is. So um, how is it getting better? Just that we're seeing like 1% or 2% changes at companies? Or do you think it's getting better qualitatively for the people who are in underrepresented groups? They're feeling more comfortable at work, less maybe um, less that they're being treated differently and that they're more welcome yeah. or both? Qualitative or quantitative? What's the change? Um, it's twofold. Our data has shown that it's mostly women who are, like in the past seven years, are applying, accepting jobs in tech at a higher rate than men ah. are. So that's changing on the uh, quantitative side. It's really so more, we're women. getting more representation of women. Yes. Which means less men are actually working at these companies? Or? No, the, the men have more options. Ah. So they're maybe rejecting certain companies or they have more ah. options to do other career paths, whereas women are more likely to accept. Ah, okay. So the definition is women are accepting more jobs, yes. men are turning down more jobs. Yes. But on a percentage basis, companies aren't at 50 50. <laughs> There aren't going to be because the applicant pool tells us that it's an average of like 30, 35 percent women. But they could be. There are um, case studies within our clients that actually do pr push for a much more equal representation. It's interesting, actually. Uh, Slack has massive representation of uh, women on the... Um, Developer front, mm -hmm. have you have you heard yes. about that? Are you aware of it? Yes, uh, they, How did they were. Do it? They were one of our pilot clients, and right now we're negotiating ah. um, a second I term with them. That's so, yeah. they work with you. Yes. So, um, what can companies do to accelerate this? And what have you learned with your software? How does your software work? Yeah. Maybe you could show it to us, and yeah, we'll do a quick demo here. I think um, it's twofold. I think that that, as I said, first is driven by the applicant with uh, behaviors, right? Like applicants are applying to more jobs or accepting more roles. And I think the other is to really understand the difficult conversations because we haven't had them. Suddenly we've seen people wanting to talk about diversity in tech, but they don't necessarily do it in a, in a productive way that will um, act, push for healing and change. So it's right really now- It's hard to have this conversation yes, right it now. Yes, it is. It is, like people are so scared to have this conversation yeah. because social media is so toxic. Oh, yes. And if you slip up, it, people can get really upset. People have felt marginalized for a long time, so mm -hmm. I think maybe they have a right to be uh, upset and, you know, they've been treated unfairly. So a lot of people I see are opting out of the conversation. That's, that's bad, isn't it? Yes, and I said this. Um, I, studied, I was a sociologist. I studied my grad degree in econo uh, you know, computer science, economics, soci sociology. One of the things that people really need to do when they're 
difficult situations is to actually have those tough conversations mm. and then move forward. And so I've, I've had tough conversations with my colleagues, with my investors, with people who are also fellow male founders talking about how different it is for a female founder or how different it is for my career. So I think it's important, but never in a vilification. I think the vilification of this conversation has actually allowed people to become polarized, where I think it should be much more of having the tough conversations with respect. And I think that you can. I mean, transparent, direct, and moving forward towards really thinking of tangible solutions to fix it. Yeah, it's interesting. We, every time I try to mansplain stuff <laughs> on Twitter. I get my ass handed to me pretty pretty severely, but I always feel like it's worth having the conversation. I mean, I invest in a lot of women and yeah. I'm an angel investor in a lot of companies. We do some, you know, we really try to focus on diversity at our events and changing the ratio on stage. Yeah. But I noticed even when as an event producer, you know, if you have one panel where it's not diverse, yeah. people judge you on that panel. They don't look at the entirety of the platform and like maybe what the statistics were for the entire event. And they're just like, these people are sexist. These people are yeah. racist because this one panel wasn't representative. And it's like- It, it happens to everybody. It's happened yeah. to me. It happened to me. Oh, you, you I, were, I, yeah. I press uh, a media. They did an interview with me and then they penalized me for having, not having more women in the team. <laughs> even though, as, a, as a female founder. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry, it happens Nobody to everybody. Gets out on Nobody stage. gets out. No, it was really it was it was quite interesting. We had there was a company there's a there's an organization called Gender Avengers. And they <laughs> they're it's a pretty cool company actually. It was it would kind of like if I was on the other side, this is the kind of approach I would take, which is they just call everybody out on the number of the gender balance of every panel. And I was like, Well, what if you're in a like a really obscure space? Like let's say, I don't know, you're mm -hmm. in uh, you have a panel of CEOs in some medical device, and there's only yeah. 10 medical device companies, they all happen to be male yeah. CEOs. Like, there's no way to force diversity on it, so you just, that happens to be the, the poor statistics in that one vertical. And they're like, you still have to figure out a way to have two female on it, females on it. And I was like, okay, I guess. <laughs> it, was, it was a weird conversation. I think people want accountability and yeah. when, when they demand ac accountability. And I think yes. the accountability portion of this discussion overtake, overtakes the rest of the discussion into a much more productive path. But I think that that's good that people do want accountability, but then they also need context. So saying, hey, yeah. like there's, we reached out to 20 women um, and 19 of them c couldn't come. That's so interesting you bring that up. We, we actually did that. We actually published at one point, um, here are the women we invited on the panel. These are the ones who said yes. We had you know 18 no's, they weren't available, yeah. two yeah. no's. And they said, that doesn't matter. All that matters is the result of who you, which women yeah. you got. So then what we started doing, it's interesting, Jackie and I, and we started having conversations with a lot of the female co-investors I have and said, yeah. Please come because we have a, we're trying to change the ratio. We really need you to come to the event. And we actually kind of put it on to some of the high profile female investors and said, listen, we really need your help in changing the ratio on these panels. Yeah. If you don't come, it's going to be 75% male or 85% male. And if you come, it's going to be 50 50. Please yeah. come to the event. Do they and come? it worked. It worked, but we, you know, they were also like, Jason, you have to understand, yeah. I'm getting invited to 20 events a week. I, I have to be in my office sometimes yes, yes. and get work done. So I think it falls on the responsibility of a lot of uh, either women and or people of color to show up at the events. And we know right. this. And um, the other day someone asked me, they're like, how do you do it? And I was like, if I don't show up, then I don't know who will. And right. if they don't see me, then, then they don't see themselves. So like if there's a potential female founder or yeah. some, or... I, I spoke at the Hispanic Scholarship Fund and young people came up to me afterwards and they're like, I didn't know that, that this is, you know, that you existed. And so now I can c continue studying computer science. And so. Right. If you don't see that it's a possibility for yeah. you. Yeah. I could see that being not heartbreaking, but it could be yeah. demoralizing, I guess would probably be the word. Like, why is there nobody like me up on the stage? Yes. Right? And that's why Freda Kapoor told me that. Like, you know, you could really be part of the change, Jason. Yeah, if you, I love Freda. She's one of our She's been, yeah, she's fantastic. So what does this project yeah. include? Tell me about Project Include. What is that? So I, I am one of the founding team members of Project Include. It's a nonprofit. Um, it's others, there's other seven women and myself who started this. Um, it was just a project to talk about truth, diversity, and inclusion. And we're proud now that we are, um, that it's a nonprofit. There's a director in charge now. Um, we have different um, 
abilities for startup include where there's cohorts of startups going through or the program to really be inclusive. In, and then we have an upcoming VC include as well. And everybody can go to projectinclude.org. And it's just to talk about the issue or? No, it's to give the support to those founders that really want to, eh, um, Oh, I see. Yeah, so we've had, the first cohort was last year. We have a second cohort that's about to start, but yeah. So underrepresented uh, founders no, getting no, no. support? No, no, any founders. Oh, any founder to make their company more inclusive. Yes. Got it. Now I understand. Yeah, so that startup include, Project Include itself is a nonprofit, and there's VC Include to also guide venture capitalists on how to promote diversity and inclusion within their portfolio companies. So let's take a look at your software. Yeah. I mean, you're here, you're a founder. Yeah. That's yeah. what we like to do here. We like to yeah, look definitely. at products. Show me your yes. product. This morning I was interviewing a head of uh, data science who comes from also the, sort of the recruiting platform. Um, what I really discuss with Atypica, and this is our new website that's about to come out um, yeah, next uh, week or the week after, is that we really think about analytics and data-driven decisions around mm -hmm. the modern workforce. As you see here, when we don't talk about, hey, it feels good to hire a woman, it's much more like, are there more women with these degrees that I want to apply at your company and mm -hmm. make it more diverse in it? The, the diversity of the product. Um, we do have, um, I just, right before I came here, um, our patent agent just sent me the provisional patent. Oh. So what we do is actually take the resume, and from the resume, we extract all the information necessary that we think can predict aggregate information around the applicants. Um, then we use public information and industry information, so we use government data and machine learning, obviously. So. Our accuracy rate for gender is about 96%. So we can take a look at aggregate and say, here, for this demo, as you know, we call it Pied Piper because it's one of my favorite shows. Yes. But yeah, the there's Ehrlich. Company. Hi, Ehrlich. So here we are. We're looking at Ehrlich, and he's the most misogynistic, yeah. uh, insane pothead. <laughs> but but he, putting he, that aside, <laughs> you can he, see the number of applicants and yes. how many are female versus male. Yes. And as you can see here, they actually had a, a peak with yeah. female applicants about la early um, last year. Now they're, but they're the same trends. We also look at the applicants and the likability that people will get higher. Mm -hmm. So as you see here, when we go back to women, they're more likely to get higher than they, than they applied. <laughs> Got it. Whereas men are less likely to get hired because men are rejecting the company. Interesting. Yes. So, and that just shows men have more options overall. Yes. So that's an issue. Yeah, it Women is an issue. Women get offered less jobs. And we also look, look at statistical significance, meaning everything being equal, um, what is the higher rate? And so our statistical significant testing actually tends, takes 10 times longer than our original algorithms because we are telling the story of likelihood of being hired, who's likely to get either rejected, what are the applicant behaviors, hmm. and then we give the reasons here. Um, ah, along these people now are tracking, hey, why didn't we hire this person? Was it experience, relevant yes, experience? Didn't have skills. relevant experience? And did you find any correlations in the early companies without saying the names of the companies, but um, where they had, let's say, blind spots? They were so, holding women to a higher, uh, do, do the hiring managers hold women to a higher standard? I've yes, that. And so we're looking at that. We're looking at the composition ah. of the teams as well as the comments that people are making. But as you can mm. see here, even... Um, women here or other like actually withdrew for another reason and they huh. never documented it. So we are asking companies to actually go and say, if women say other, can you specify what uh. other was it? Um, there was no time. And then here, um, obviously you see men will withdraw because of the timing. They're just like, we're not interested. Whereas women, that's a less. Right. So yeah, yeah about 25, 20% less times are women saying it's bad timing. So, yes. in other words, it is good timing. They might have considered the job. But there's this big swath of other reasons of why they bowed out. Yes. But which also, makes one wonder what that is. Yes, and you also want to look, for example, if the interview two for this organization, let's say customer experience, if they're withdrawing at, at a higher rate here, it doesn't seem to be that much. You might want to look at who's doing the interview too. Ah, so you could have bias on the interviewer. Yes, whereas some of them are processed. So like mm -hmm. application reviews, process tools, resume reviewing, phone screen is a human. Interview mm -hmm. one may be a technical test. So really so, yeah. this is workflow for interviews. And 
it's valuable to do this independent of gender or yes. yes or or ethnicity but it does give you some insight if you are knocking people out or people are opting out yeah and, based on one of these things and we do it this is all our own model so it's a hundred percent so we take all of the historical so you can even look at um Nothing of this is self-reported. It's the information we've taken from the resume and public information to make these predictions on aggregate. People are doing a process now, I understand, of taking the names off of yes. resumes yes. so that in that first process, you don't know if they're male or female. You don't yeah. know. Mm -hmm. You can't make any inferences about ethnicity from the name because there have been many studies where they make ethnic names and it has an adverse effect. Yes. So that's clear. Do you, are you an advocate of that or not? Because it seems like you're an advocate of understanding what the the gender and ethnicity is or not. I'm not sure. I didn't see ethnicity yeah, in there. Yeah, we, we do have another product that where we do do resume reviewing and it's all skill-based so that Got there's it. no pattern matching around um, school or names ah. or everything. So we are a big, big proponent of um, skill-based um, matching and resume review and that's that's outside so the interviewer might not know those things like which school it was but they would know it's a good school let's say or a top third school top quartile whatever they would focus on the skill set or they would be like okay i don't know whether this person went to even college but they have five years of experience in python uh, got it <laughs> skill based and so skill that's, based right. yeah that's much more important than which seems to be i mean it is uh, let's let's go into some hard questions, right? Because we're sitting here, yeah. people are afraid to have the discussion. Yeah. Let's go into some of the hard questions. Is is Silicon Valley a meritocracy when it comes to people who have high skill in a, a sought after um, programming language? Let's say so. If there is a just massive need for people who can do C plus plus, and because of the app boom. Is there really a, a bunch of bias? In other words, if somebody was from a, um, uh, an underrepresented group or was female, but they had that skill, definitively had that skill, do you perceive that they would have bias against them, even with a sought-after skill? And do the statistics back that up? Yes. We, okay. we see time and time again that a technical degree, for, let's say from Berkeley or Stanford, mm -hmm. um, will override... Um, a technical degree from San Jose State with more experience. And so I, I don't think that there is such okay, a Okay, well, thing. that's college to college. Yeah, yes, yes. So, and college to college, people might say Stanford has a higher, a harder benchmark to get into, let's say. Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't get into Stanford. I went to Fordham. I went to, like, a second-tier school. So there, there is some validity to that, right, or no? no. I mean, computer science is computer science, right? Whether the rigorous courses at that of getting in, at the end of the day, is experience. I kind of agree with you on that, actually. I kind of agree with you on that. Yeah. I think that the, like that the bias, like that you got into those yeah. better schools, doesn't exactly translate. But I understand some people want to. Some people are looking to hire based on achievement, and they see the ability to get into. Yeah a Harvard or a Stanford as a sign that you achieved greatness in high school. Is that wrong in your mind? So, is that biased or is that that they're just obsessed with people being able to... Some of the best programmers yeah. I ever worked alongside with at all these tech companies I've worked at yeah. um, were self-taught. Right. And I don't think that... Um, I went to a pretty good mm. school. I went to Berkeley, but I also got accepted to Harvard and Stanford and didn't go there. So what, what my life could have been... Um, I don't think about it. I think about more of what the learnings that I got from so, undergrad. But these are recent grads. Uh, my my team is composed of almost different types of, you know, degrees mm -hmm. um, from civil engineering, even though we're a data science company, to chemical, to health. So they all got a degree, but they all have a passion for data and to so build products. So if someone says, I want to just hire Ivy League people, <laughs> I'm going to take this... Uh, because I, 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 the reason I want to pursue this is because I did have somebody notable say to me from one of these big companies a number of years ago, um, not in a public space. Uh, we just hire people based on raw intelligence, and raw intelligence is like your SAT score and what school you went to. Therefore, we just want the smartest people in the room, and we're unabashed about that. And if you went to a second-tier school like I did, or your SATs weren't 1,600, mine were 1,150 or whatever, you just wouldn't qualify. Is that bias, 
Or is that a high standard in your mind? There's clearly a bias that will probably derail them from their business goals at the end. Google established this bias for a long, long time, over a decade, if not over 15 years. And then they did the data and they did the studies and they figured out that GPA did not matter on <laughs> in their hiring or in their employee performance. And then they took it all back after having established this for X amount of decades. Wait, who, who did this? Google. Google did, right. Yes. Google had this position. Yeah, oh, no, had they had a GPA requirement. They had for, a GPA requirement. Yeah, up until like five years ago, I believe. So you just had to be top of your class or yeah. you couldn't go to Google. I had a, a friend that worked at YouTube that worked there, did a phenomenal job as a contractor for a whole year. The reason that would, they didn't hire him in 2008 or nine was because he had a 3.4 GPA. So was crushing it at the job but didn't crush it in college, just did okay. He was 29. I mean, he had been out of college almost nine years. It didn't, right. really didn't matter. But Google still believed that his 3.4 yeah. GPA from whatever year yes. was the deciding factor, factor on his ability at YouTube 10 years later. Yes. It's nonsense. Nonsense. And then they found out. They ran the data. They ran their That's hiring. They ran employee performance and then scraped it all off, saying, no, it did not matter. <laughs> that's fascinating. Yes. Um, and what about by school? So that's GPA. Mm -hmm. But what about bias towards schools? I'm just, I want to yeah. kind of, I know it's a finer point, but yeah. do you think if somebody says, I want to hire from MIT, Stanford, and Harvard, and I don't know, pick five schools that are in the top whatever percentile, because I just, in the past, I've seen that people have been great from those schools, and I... Uh, um, we uh, we know those schools are very hard to get into and they have their selection process. Is that bias? It's a clear pattern matching that they want to justify. Okay. I'm not here to uh, say whether it's a bias or not. I believe it is, but it's pattern matching that they want to justify. The thing they have to understand is that the pool is only so limited. So while they're saying, I only want to hire from these schools, all of tech is also saying that. So if you've run the numbers, the probability of you hiring people from these schools um, yeah, or so their on, a on a pragmatic like, basis, like, yeah. it's so I, you know I, the reason I, I bring up this hard issue is because I I have heard from there was a company in New York I believe it was Juno or something who just said we only are hiring Ivy League schools like that's it we will only hire from the Ivy League and we're winning because of that and I'm just curious if that is bias or that is having some clever hack to hiring only the smartest people and creating a culture of these. Only the kids who were top of their class who could get what, there because this is the debate, isn't yeah. it? What's winning to them, though, right? Like, we want to Making the most money. We, we want to aggregate <laughs> the a database of all... Right now, we only have U.S.-based schools, but eventually, like, we can say, what's the MIT of Mexico? Or what's the MIT of Brazil? Should you... If you're going to hire the MITs in the United States, don't you want to hire global talent that also That's went to those... That, you know, you're looking at... Uh, diversity of education in a different lens. Um, I, do, I think like making money for them, that's great. I think having a business goal that is in par with uh, impacting the world and not only the workforce. I mean, McKinsey published a report that if by 2025 we close the wage gap between women, that would bring in, I think it was $24 trillion to the that's global. That's ridiculous. That they, I mean, how yeah. do we even have a yeah. wage gap between men and women? It makes yeah. no sense to me. All right. When we get back from this final break, we're going to go into more of the hard questions that people <laughs> do not want us to discuss. Yes. I'm going to do just a couple of fair, fair warning, trigger warning. I want to talk about the pipeline problem that people refer to. And if there is a pipeline problem, or if that is <laughs> BS, when we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody, let me tell you about an amazing website that I love and use regularly. It's called Capterra. Capterra, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A. -R -R -A. I always feel like it's a good idea to spell it because you might be listening, you're driving, you're running. You need to know Capterra.com. It is a website where you can find software that your business needs. You ever have this? God, I need a new piece of software. I need some mail server software. I want to get a better price on my mail server. I need a website or I need CRM or I need sales software. You know, you always need some software and you know what? There's so many different applications out there today in so many different categories that wouldn't it be nice if there was a website that could help you sort through it like Yelp, but for software, 
for business software. Well, that's Captera. Thousands of ratings and reviews from actual software users. And it's such an easy to use website. They have 400 categories of software to choose from, over 400. And whether you need help with website building or customer service project management, maybe you want to track applications or figure out your email marketing, millions of people use Captera every month. And using Captera is absolutely free for users. There's no obligation. You don't need to register. It's a free resource that will help you make the right software decisions. And we all know, if you make a wrong decision about your software, what's going to happen? You spend all this time, all this money, and you have everybody trained up, and then you made the wrong decision. You've got to rip it out, start over. Everybody's got to get trained again. New user handles, all this kind of nonsense. If you want to get it right on the first try, go to capterra.com slash twist. capterra.com slash twist. C A P. T-E-R-R-A dot com slash twist. Find the software that will help you do what you do better. That's all they want to do at Captera. They want to make you more successful. So go ahead and visit captera.com slash twist. Thanks again to our friends over at Captera for making a great website and a great directory that's super helpful and for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. We truly appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest, Laura Gomez. She is L-A-U-R-A. She worked at YouTube, Twitter, Jawbone. She even managed Twitter en Espanol. Yes. So Spanish Twitter. Yes. Black Twitter and Spanish Twitter, those are very unique, specific uh, components of Twitter success. Yes? Um, International users and African-American user base are... Very key to almost every single social media, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. For sure. Yes. Like Instagram is yeah. massively yes. uh, driven by African-American yeah. uh, content. content and also celebrities too. Mm-hmm. Like the, I, w- I just watch like, um, who do I follow? What's her name? Um, God, I forgot her name. I always forget her name because Muva is what she calls herself. Um, ah, it's her nickname. What is it? Amber... Rose. Okay. Oh, yeah. She is huge on yeah, Instagram. like Instagram, like 50 million followers. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's crazy. And she's not like an artist or a. No, she's just a. She's a person. Phenomenon. Yeah. She's not even like a basketball player or a rapper or a singer or an actress. She's just uh, yeah. a personality. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, the, the scale of it. Okay. Let's, um, let's talk about the issue that everybody gets very triggered by becomes a big fight, pipelines. When people say the word pipeline problem, some people get very upset that this is uh, even said that there's a pipeline problem. So let me just ask you candidly, is there a pipeline problem in some cases where there's not enough graduates coming in? And why is the idea that we could improve the pipeline uh, met with such um, uh, anger? Yeah. That's a great that. question. Um, we were asking ourselves this morning on, my t- uh, on Slack, my team and I. Um, first and foremost, because everything's anecdotal. Mm-hmm. And this anecdote, unless you all actually have the hard data, you have this, the information, you can't say. Second, it's a blanket statement. So right. if you're saying, it, I have a pipeline issue finding female Android m- in- engineers who know this, maybe that's... That's not anecdotal. You're actually, it's not blanket. You're saying, I'm trying to find in this or finding female engineers for my startup that is SaaS and like whatever. Yeah. So like, but when you just say it's a pipeline issue, it just, it triggers people because it's such a blanket statement. It's so right. anecdotal and nothing is backed by true data. Right. We have that. And that's the part that we want to say, okay, here, there is no such thing as a blanket diversity solution. There's no such thing as a blanket pipeline issue. And then we look at the representation. I am Latina, and I look at the representation of Latinos in general in tech. Two to three percent, even though we're graduating with degrees at a faster rate than the rest of the population. And what so, should the percentage be if it, were, if it were to look like the composition of graduations from computer science? Or? As the rest of the, so we have data by the, um, by the California uh-huh. Um, employment agency where like that ratio is anywhere from 12 to 14 percent it should it. be two, two to three percent that those are professionals right professional so it should be four x yes ballpark five x yes. yes but it's not no and the reason 
as best as we can look at it, is probably some bias on the part of the companies or creating cultures that don't feel inclusive so those people don't want to join. It's the bias, the pattern matching, and the referrals networks. Ah, the referral network. Explain so, why that is so critical. So I work at a tech company early mm-hmm. on. I then decide I'm going to build my own company. Who am I going to hire? Oh, the guys that I worked with. Right. Earlier on, or which makes sense. It's it makes it makes total, total sense. sense I, but I've worked with you, these people before. We yes. could, we could start on second base in terms of our rhythm together. We'll hit the ground running. Would definitely, be the, definitely. What people would say. I think so, but um, I didn't build my company built on my network. I could have tapped into my network easily. Instead, I chose to build a company that was truly came from different experiences and viewpoints. Did it take you longer? Yes. Was it more arduous? Yes. And then I guess if it was arduous and it took you longer, then what was the benefit would be the question. And, and do you feel that that arduous journey, that longer journey to build a more diverse organization, uh, what has been the outcome for you as the CEO? Has it yeah, made definitely. a better culture or has it actually been better results for I your company? I think there's better authenticity in our, yeah. in our tools. Uh, we went to market with our new product that you just saw yeah. a couple months ago. And the response from companies are very data-driven as well, right. big tech companies, was because we were looking at a lens, through a, we were looking at this problem through a different lens, and we weren't replicating our own biases. So you see products are being built all the time now with biased machine learning. Yeah. <laughs> so what is that going to be like? We're going to perpetuate the behaviors that people have, whether it's through recruiting, hiring, or through your own products. And so when I... Although it took a little bit longer to build an inclusive team, our number one core value, the number one was uh, be humble and authentic. And I think a lot of entitlement happens in tech. And so like when you're entitled, you don't understand your business as well as you should, or you don't build that empathy with your client base. And um, I think we're testament that clients want empathy when they're working, especially in enterprise. (laughs) Tell me what's the best way for a white guy like me (laughs) who feels like maybe I, I felt for a while in my life like I was an outsider. Mm-hmm. But in truth, on the spectrum of outsiders in America, I'm, I'm nowhere near the people yeah. who are the most outsiders. And on a global basis, I'm certainly not. If you take it on a global basis, obviously I was born in America. Yeah. How should a white, male, successful tech guy, I'm not a bro, but um, how should I approach the discussion of uh, diversity and gender, what is the best approach for people in leadership positions to help solve the problem? I think being an ally doesn't mean just saying, hey, I support female founders or I have you know female guests on my show. It's more of saying, what are the things? I think there was an excellent point that Ellen um, Powell, who's one of our other members of Project Include, she tweeted out a couple of weeks ago, it was like, um, is someone saying, wrote a medium post around this person, you know, had like spoke up for me when I was not in the room. Mm. And that sponsorship is so important, correct? Like the sponsorship, I have a pretty diverse set of investors, um, you know, of all different races and gen- and Which isn't an easy thing to do. No, no. Because that's, I mean, if you look at the statistics there, no. it's truly miserable. But also I have, you know, a stereotypical, you know, ben- uh, venture, you know, with... White guys. Bunch- yeah, white guys. But they're you very supportive. <laughs> they're very supportive. <laughs> I know. These white guys are supportive. Really? <laughs> yeah, I find yeah, it no. hard to believe. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I, my, the, We're yeah, laughing, 22. but it's true. It's like, it's... It's that they're my their support. They're my sponsor. Yeah. They've sponsored yeah. me not only with capital but yeah. with support. Right now, I'm in the process of hiring two C-level executives, mm. uh, head of data science and a, a chief operating officer. My investors are interviewing them right. that because they know I was like, I don't have the time. I'm a solo founder and I have to run a company and sales and yeah. on board. And they're helping. And so, like, I think that sponsorship is really important. So when you ask, like, and you can't sponsor everybody, right? Like, we can't. Like, we have our day jobs. We have to do so much. But I make it a point also to sponsor outside of the Silicon Valley to sponsor um, 
founders of colors. Usually mm-hmm. they tend to be uh, African-American men who live in Atlanta or who live somewhere else. And when they come here, they want intros, right? We all know that the network is very strong here. So sure. I, tr- I tend to be, you know, maybe I can't do it to all, but I can do it to two founders and make those intros and make those. So I think sponsorship, whether you're a white guy like you or you're a Latina yeah. female founder, as long as we're sponsor at least certain people and we're honest and authentic in it because if we just go and put a blanket solution of like, I'm going to write a medium post about how much I love female founders and you really don't live that every day. It's hard. People are going to hold you accountable. Yeah. It's, I think this is, I don't know about you, but I feel like even through all this bad stuff that's gone down, yeah. a lot of bad feelings, I feel like we're trending towards a more just and a better version of Silicon Valley. I yes. actually, I, maybe I'm just pos- a positive person, but I kind of feel like things have gotten a lot better because I know in the early days of the conference where we'd have people apply, the number of female founders just applying on an open application were you know, low single digits. Yeah. Now all of a sudden we're starting to see double digits. Yeah. We're starting to see significant double digits with founders in them. So something has happened in the last decade yeah. where women feel more welcome and are getting funded more. So I feel like it is trending in the right way just based on the statistics I see yeah. for my incubator and et cetera. So do you feel it's getting better or I, is that just my white explaining? No, it? no, I do. You know, I'm, I'm like you. I'm an, uh, I'm an optimist and I also think – as I, I was explaining to you during the break, very much more an, an empathetic approach to solving a lot of the heart issues. Um, I think when all of these things, all the news that broke up, broke out like in the last couple of months around yeah. female founders, um, I chose to then tweet something that was very different. I said, when we celebrate other people's you know, demise, we're not going to start healing ourselves. Right. So when, so I think having those conversations and seeing like, yes. People need to be held accountable for their behaviors. But as female founders or as more people of color in tech, we need to really have that and see that for every, you know, that five years from that, a female founder won't even think that that's very different. Yeah, than I, it is. I think it's sort of now becoming like the idea of a female founder being like some unique unicorn and like, oh my God, we found one. It's like, yeah. we found one. I mean, like, it, it's, it's, it, I don't think like it's half the industry yet, but I would say a third of all the companies coming out of incubators have a female on the founding team or the, you know, yeah. the, the yeah. amongst the founders, which seems like real progress. Yes, and I think there's still a lot of progress, right? Because they, the female founders will be there, but they need to get funded <laughs> in order to stay there. They do. And they do. I think, as I said, like I, when people ask me how it is to be a female founder, sometimes I'm like, I'm a solo founder, which is harder. So, <laughs> and, and then so I go. So the intersectionality yeah, of yeah. solo founder, founder versus yes. female versus it's, Latino. Yeah, yeah. Solo is the hardest. Yes, it is. And I think, persona. I mean, you know, you've had, I guess here talking about solo founder oh. and that. Well, it's so lonely because yeah. if you're a solo founder, what I always tell people, you know, when I invest in a solo founder, I say, listen, you can't tell your team just how badly things are going yeah. or else they'll quit. Yeah. You can't tell your investors how badly things are going or else they won't give you yeah. the bridge you need or keep investing in all likelihood. So who do you call as a solo founder? I always tell the solo founders, when things are terrible, call me. Yeah. Because I'm a founder first and foremost. I understand yeah. how bad it can get. Yeah, definitely. But it's lonely. Yeah, it is. It is and and uh, people need to get. I thankfully had the support of my investors when I said I need mm. to hire a C-level executive to come and help me with operations. And so we're in the process of that and very excited. And so, yes. But I think at the end of the day, do I think it's getting better? Yes. I've, I've lived in Silicon Valley my whole life. Right. I got my first internship at Hewlett Packard. I wasn't talking about these issues six, seven years ago. Mm. We just kind of brushed it under the table. There were times where I couldn't, I only spoke Spanish to the kitchen staff. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, now there's, you, there's changes to be made and done. And there's a lot of support networks that are popping up to support yeah. more diversity. And um, there's a lot of advocacy going on. And I think those, I have to thank the rest of the industry too. For people that are advocating, um, whether they're inside tech companies or whether they um, tweet something and yeah. in order that they are actually sharing their story so people n- can talk about I tried it. I to do it. The approach I've taken is to stop arguing with people on Twitter about the issue <laughs> and just quietly do work. Yeah. Because it seems like there's people on Twitter lose all empathy 
it becomes a big fight about how much was handed to me and how easy I have it versus how hard other people have it. And then I'm trying to defend myself, like saying like, well, I didn't have it easy. My, you know, we, my parents went broke and I was from Brooklyn and it wasn't hard. It wasn't easy for me. Then I was like, you know what? This is like a zero sum game. It's- oh, it is. I was, I was, uh, a columnist did an, uh, a profile of me, um, last week or the week before. And then people started arguing around because uh, she included something around my appearance. And then people started arguing with me around whether I would have been in that column if I looked different. And so there's always these discussions on Twitter that are oh, not... Oh, so the idea is if you were photogenic, you got the piece? Yes. Uh, so there's all... <laughs> yeah, you know, I've struggled this issue myself. A lot of people are saying, J. Cal, you know, you're so attractive. <laughs> no, luckily, I don't have to deal with this issue. People yeah, are not putting like, me on the cover always, of their magazine. Like, like, I think I read an article this morning around Snapchat, and like they were talking about like the T-shirt that Evan was wearing. So I think people are always focusing on like yeah. what... what what is engaging conversation? I think it's taking those conversations offline. It's making sure that there's empathy in the process, but also making sure there's accountability. Yeah. Because you can be all nice and empathetic, but if people are not held accountable, the, yeah. the it's just a bummer that like you're yeah. you're out there doing the work, and then somebody's like, oh, you got some credit and some press, which press can be very helpful for a business. Yeah. You might get yeah. a new yeah. hire, you might get yeah. a new investor, you might get, and they're like, oh my god, the only reason you're getting press is because of this. I remember Kim Polisi. Uh, in our industry um, back in the day was a female founder and they put her in a series of ads I guess like one of the Cisco's of the yeah. world or whoever were like wow she's a founder and she's attractive and let's just put her in this ad campaign they put her in an ad campaign that all the knives came out oh she's not a serious founder they put her in an ad campaign mm-hmm. you know yeah. and it was like well if I got asked to be in an ad campaign for Tesla or for some product I loved I would do it like, they're not asking me, but I would do it. And then would you judge me based on that? It's crazy, yeah. right? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, no. But I think in general, I think what happens is that um, there are women, I think, in general are held to different standards. Yeah. Right? Um, than men are in general. And I think, like, we just need to ma- make sure that we are aware of that, of those standards when we're investing in women. Like... I think about it, you know, everything's going great with Atypica, um, hiring people, we're moving into our new offices, it's very exciting. But I think about it, I'm like, what if I were to fail? Like, do I have the privilege of failure in, in st- startups? That's and that's not a privilege that I actually have as yeah. a female founder or as a woman of color. And so that's, whereas you other feel people- like if you fail once, that's it, you're written off. You get your one and done. Yes. And whereas I see my other friends who are founder friends who have the privilege like, of failure. Screw it. I'll fail and I get more money next time. Yes. It's interesting you say that. I had a female founder I invested in who said, Jason, because I was like, wow, you're so hardworking and like so responsive and the results are so great. And she's like, I have to make this work. I said, what do you mean? She said, if I don't make this work, I'll never be funded again. That's mm-hmm. my one shot. Yeah. I said, why is it your one shot? I would invest in you again. She goes, no, women get one shot as the founder and yeah. that's it. And I was like, well, that's, that's a very interesting point. Mm-hmm. That, that like people, yeah, we, we, we looked at it and said, we're not getting enough female applicants in, the, in our zone of where we want to invest, which is call it 10 to 75K in MRR, mm-hmm. you know, monthly reoccurring revenue for those people who are listening. Like maybe they're on the road to making a half million dollars a year, quarter million, a million. That's where we kind of like to engage in a startup. And um, we're like, you know what? Let's just move upstream. Let's just go upstream and see, uh, you know, not to use the pipeline, but I, I'll use a river, which is, hey, maybe up the river, if we walk up the river and we'll find out, hey, these female founders are struggling with these issues. And here's, here are the ones who are most likely to hit that, you know, uh, characteristic of where we want to invest next. And so we just did a female founder university. We did it kind of quietly. We had like, I think 400 women apply. We accepted 50. We did it for two days. And now I think four or five of them are going to come to our incubator. That's awesome. And it was like, you know what? You don't, you, you can actually fix the pipeline problem. Yeah. If you just go, I find, if, or if you look at it as a river metaphor, if the pipeline wants too triggering for people, but if we go up the river and you find, hey, this is where the, the stream is. Here's where the water's coming out mm-hmm. of, right? Here's where the talent is. You can help them navigate the river to get to the point at which they're ready for venture-style investing, yes. right? And so I, I think people just have to be a little more creative when they say they're not seeing but, enough candidates. You know, uh, Caper, 
It's also, Capra, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they did that with me. I mean, they didn't invest in, in a tipic until like maybe 14 months after I first started talking to them. Ah. And both Mitch and Frida had very concrete product and, and, and feedback during my demo and said, mm. do this. And then I did, and I ah. figured out how to focus. And then um, later on, was they when mm. True came in, they funded, they came in and funded, yeah. and then they pulled in someone else, which is uh, true. You made it Hudson. impossible for them to say no. Yeah. They told you what they wanted, and yeah. you did it. Yeah, but that's the feedback of all founders um, to listen to what, what the market, what the investors are telling you, and like learn from that. And then also that's, go with your own instinct, right? Yeah. It's super important because yeah. a lot of times people are working on projects independent of gender, independent yeah. of ethnicity, but people work on projects that are, don't have venture scale. They can never hit $100 million in revenue because it's a service-based mm-hmm. business or it's you know, just not going to give a venture capitalist the return profile so they think, oh, there's bias here. It's like the bias is that the business is, doesn't have venture returns. It's, a, it's never going to grow to 50 or $100 mm-hmm. million. The bias isn't against you. It's against the revenue profile. Figure out a way to unlock the revenue yeah. so that it can become bigger and it's not like in a niche. It's a little bit... Mm. Blue Ocean and bigger, and then you could unlock it. I, I see a lot of people, and this might be part of this perverse um, dynamic where I think women are held to a higher standard, so therefore they try to pick businesses that can quickly become profitable, profitable because they're not given the chance, but then there's this duplicity where the investors are saying, well, we want a bigger vision. And it's like, well, which one do you want? Do you want me to get revenue quickly? Well, that means I have to have a narrower vision and provide value now, or do you want me to go big? And have like a billion dollar vision. And it it really is like this maddening, like, are we going big or are we going small? Are we going to go, you know, with a flywheel where we make a little bit of money? Or are we going to go with something where we go big really quick? Correct. You know, over time. It's it's, it's, it's a constant challenge. Listen, Laura Gomez, (laughs) Atypica is available now for purchase. Yeah. Atypicainc.com, A-T-I-P-I-C-A-I-N-C. Dot com. You can follow Laura on uh, Twitter, L-A-U-R-A. She's part of the First Name Club. Yes. Very impressive. And uh, get get a Typica. And uh, what does the software cost? How do you charge for it, I wonder? It depends on the um, computational value of each resume. So what are we... Computational value of each resume. Yeah. Interesting. Explain. Yeah. So it's not a flat fee because whether we run 100,000 resumes or 1 million, you can get... Any seats you mm. can give seats to your recruiters, to your heads of talent acquisition, ah. diversity, your CEO. So it's on usage. Yeah, it's on and complexity it, it, of the resume. Yeah, of the resume. So because we're extracting and then we run, we host them, and so it all depends. A lot of our tech clients um, have sort of a more of a base annual fee. So but, five or ten grand a year. Uh, more. Yeah, twenty-five, yes, fifty. Yes. Yeah, ah. and um, anywhere from ten to twenty. Got it. And then, um, so but, that's that's reasonable. Yeah. Thousand dollars a month, two thousand yeah, a month. Yeah, and then for large enterprise, obviously, like we then have to see how they want to work. But um, this is an intelligent solution. It's really we're working with with companies to un- understand the skill set of their applicants, to understand how applicants are moving, rec- whether it's gender or race, mm-hmm. but really just making sure that they're retaining the talent through that, that pipeline and doesn't become a leaky pipeline. Can you go? Uh, I like that leaky pipe- pipeline. Um, can you just? Um, go on to LinkedIn and be like, here are all the Latino women and just, you could just <laughs> well, give people like, here is the goal mind of where you can really find some yeah. of the talented people who are underrepresented and well, do companies just ask you for that? Like, just give me a hundred applicants of... But they already have it. I they mean, already have it. They have it in their applicant tracking systems, right? They do. It's, yeah, they so already So that's not there. the issue is finding them. No. The issue is figuring out what... Surfacing. Ha- surfacing. Surfacing and, and uh, recommending them in a way that makes value for their company size, whether mm. they're like 200 people or 2,000, and what roles are they looking they for? They do events like we do. If I was in one of these big companies like Twitter or something, yeah. or Facebook or Google, and I had this diversity problem, uh, I would host events like black girls who code, Latina girls yes. in tech, whatever, so. and just try to have like a regularly occurring events on campus celebrating and bringing together those underrepresented groups so they could be like, oh, we're on campus drinking Phil's coffee at Facebook. We belong on campus because they're having the event on campus. Don't they do that or no? They do, but I, I think don't think more, they do it that what, often. What they need to do is actually have recruiters at this event. Yes. Right? They don't. They, what? They, ho- they host this. Ev- I've been at events at, uh, at this company. So where, dumb. Like, li- literally... 
dozens, if not hundreds, of Latino professionals with degrees, everything from law. And then nobody to, shows up from HR. No. And no, none of the managers show up. <laughs> no. It's so dumb. And so it's the same when it comes to investment, right? Like if you go to these mm. events and there's female founders or anything, there's yeah. ideas out there that you might want to be able to take a look at. Um, mm. And I think that that's really important. Yeah. And so I think that it goes both ways on increasing both how you want. At the end of the day, founder is a founder. But like if you actually go try to find those founders in different settings that are not at a happy hour at on a Friday night, then you might get lucky. <laughs> We had, um, we, you know, it's coming up with strategies is really, I think, one of the key takeaways from our discussion today because really, you, if you don't um, have a plan to resolve the issues around diversity, then there's no way to succeed. It's just not going to happen accidentally because if it would have happened just organically, it would have happened already because yeah. the issue is not the pipeline. If 12% of the graduates in computer science are Latino and 2% are getting hired, it's not the pipeline. Yeah. I mean, it might be the pipeline when we get to 12%. And you'd say yeah. we need to yes. get to 14 or 18% graduating, but that's not the issue we're at yet. No, no, we're not. And I think at the end of the day, it's really, it's not, it's looking at adapting to the workforce. And if you, and if the workforce is, looks very different each year, and it's going to look different in five years and 10 years, if businesses are not adapting to that workforce, yeah. they're going to really miss out on the value that they're able to provide to the business, to the product, to the companies. And so hopefully yeah. people don't see this as a, they see this as a business imperative more than they see it as something like, oh, I want more female I'll listen, engineers. Uh, in my job, yeah. angel investor, I just want huge returns. Yes, there you and go. And here's what I've learned. The, the underrepresented individuals are working 10 times harder because like you, they realize like, I'm not going to get a second opportunity. So if you're actually placing bets, and you believe that hustle and hard work and the desire to win is important, which I think yeah, is pretty damn important. Like investing in female founders, I found is just, you, you, you never, I've never seen a circumstance where a female founder did not put their entire heart and soul into their project. And I can tell you with male founders, I have seen many times where they were at Web Summit, Summit at Sea, Summit here, Summit there, and they were never at home, TEDx, and they were never doing any work. Mm. And they never even got their product to market. I just think the women work harder and take it more serious. I think it's because we know we get, got this opportunity and we yeah. are so passionate about what, whatever it is. I remember, and we can, um, someone introduced me um, to a male, an African-American male founder. Mm -hmm. His deck was, I saw his deck and I was just like, what is going on here? And then in the middle of his deck, he's like, um, my ARR is 1.5 this year. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah. And I what? told him, I called, I got on a phone call. I haven't met him. Start with that. <laughs> I was like, you need to start off with that. He got funding like within a month. Two seconds. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it was that, it was that yeah. even his own presentation or like the ability for us, for either people of color or female founders to say, hey, here's the value that we can provide. It might be not that, that the fact that we just need that guidance, that sponsorship. And at the end of the day, I do think like, I don't think I've met of all my female founder friends that started off this journey with me, the only reason that some of them are still going at it really hard and the only reason that they some of them didn't is because they didn't get investment. Yeah. But the ones that did and with little, very little, Th that's we, thing, we've, gone, <laughs> we've, gone, we've gone very far. Capital efficiency is another one of those yeah. things that are you know, super sought after as an angel because you only have so, many, so much dry powder. You need your yeah. founders to be careful. It's interesting when we did the, the Female Founder University, we were kind of going upstream saying, hey, maybe we can find people and we had this actual other realization. Once we got past a certain number of applicants, like in the first 50, we we're like, okay, yes, like five, you know, these are ready to come to the incubator, 45 aren't. Then all of a sudden we got to 100, 200, 400 applicants. And then all of a sudden of the 50, they were all in our Goldilocks zone. Yeah. All of them had products in market. All of them had some, I would say, well, maybe 35%. 35 of 50 had some level of revenue, 15 had some level of traction, but non-revenue traction. Yeah. So it was like, whoa, wait a second. We're not lowering the standard here. We created a specific device, and that device, people came out of the woodwork to participate in that event, mm -hmm. and people are not creating those, stra uh, those, those strategies and those opportunities. And once you do it, just all of a sudden, it, it seems clear as day that there are enough... It it was hard for me to get angel investment, even even thought with my network and who I, I knew. And it was like, it was... Coming out of the, Google and, and Twitter, Twitter, it was hard for you to get angel Yes, investment. and so I think like it's just really hard. Um, I kept it alive because I did participate in an accelerator. Mm. And, um, and within that time, I did meet other angel investors um, and then my lead investors. So I think it's really, really... 
it's really, really, I've been on the other side, and so I know how hard it is to be on the other side. I was thinking, you tell me what you think. Because we did FEMA Founder University. Yeah. Right? We did it very quietly. Like, I, I think I tweeted twice, like, we're doing this. We did one email. Because I don't want people to be like, oh, Jason's trying to get a cookie yeah. or like a gold yeah. star. You know, it's like, it's really the female members of my team are driving it as m- much or more than I am. But now, do you think we should do one for underrepresented minorities? Yes. If we did African American and Latino Founder University, would we be criticized for doing that? Would it be inappropriate for me to do it, or do you think we should do it? No. Because we have a debate now. No, We're active I debating think, this. No, I think you should do it. I, I do think it. there's a lot of resources right. from underrepresented founders. Um, I was in a panel at TechCrunch Justice. Yeah, and I saw I, that. Yes, and I was in a panel. Megan uh, Dickey was the... Uh, yes, uh, yes. She, you know, her first job was working for me. She did lunch. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's awesome. She's I great. Love Megan. Um, but there, um, one of the other fellow panelists that I don't want to point out, but he also worked for an accelerator, and he was like, oh, there's... Um, quit your job and, and promote full time and I was like sometimes underrepresented founders can't quit their job right like they no, don't have a rent. friend they don't have a friends and family option to sleep on a couch yeah. yes and so I think it's really important yeah. for, for people to understand the difference around under, like Latin X and black founders as opposed to other founders the challenges are very 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 much different than female founders correct um, so I think yeah. it's really, really important to have those discussions, and I mm-hmm. think that the, the support is needed. All right. Now you got me thinking I should yeah. do it. Because I was just going to do it and say, like, hey, let's just try to give a third of the slots, and but yeah. maybe just do a dedicated one where you say, hey, we're yeah. going to do this. Yes. You know, just as a white guy, I, you know, I, I'm always, like, I've learned, like, maybe I don't, I shouldn't be the guy to do certain things, or, like, I try not to be too vocal about these things. Because there's a whole contingent of people who are, like, just just ready to criticize, yeah. you know, any kind of good act. So I'm just maybe keeping it very quiet and doing it very, like, on the DL. We email our list. We get the work done. And then we just move on. And we don't, like, try to, like... your brand, Jason, you, I think there's a, a responsibility for you to yeah. actually do this and to do it just as the learnings that you'll have. And as an investor, mm. the potential you can see there. I've seen incredible ideas coming out out of underrepresented founders outside of the valley, like mm. so much. And they all are so thirsty to have someone hear them out and what they're doing. All right, we're doing and it. And I saw, yeah. That's it. Latino, so do it. And if, that's, if you need me to speak, Should I'll I speak. Should I use the term African American or black? Um, I think whatever. This you feel is another thing I, I think a lot of white people need clarity on. Yeah. I use African American, but they call it black Twitter sometimes. But I want to also be most respectful. But some people say, just use the term black. But other um, people say, no, use African American. I think it's. I've Latino learned, is the right word for Latino. Yeah. Right? Or now it's Latinx or whatever. I Latinx. Don't know. Yeah. What is that? I never because heard that. Because Latina or Latino at the end. Oh, is so gender specific. Gendered. So Latinx. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So Latinx is. I got a, that. I'm writing notes. And, and, and I think me. as terminology goes, it's just making sure that um, we've had this discussion with the women of Project Include, and I think it's all very much preferential. For example, we choose, or I like URM for underrepresented minorities. I like that too. So instead of just saying uh, some people use people of color, um, et cetera. So some, yeah, but technically, yeah. You, you know, people who are Indian are people of color. People who are yeah. Asian are people of yeah. color. And they're overrepresented. Yeah, so underrepresented minorities. is URM, what, um, underrepresented U-R-M, yeah. minorities, is yeah. not a derogatory statement. No. Because I was told by somebody they thought that they felt that was derogatory. And I was like, I don't, I, that's the term I hear people in the, you know, industry who are doing social justice and who are working on diversity issues, that's the term they use. So I think that it's the right term. But you see how sensitive words are? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think minorities, just say minorities when we are, like, Latinos are the majority. But when you say... That's under, weird, too. When, when you say underrepresented minorities in tech, you're talking about uh, there are a minority in tech. They are yeah. underrepresented. This is the thing people don't realize is, like, Latino Americans and are going to yeah. be the majority of the country very yeah. soon. Yeah, yeah, well... In right, our right. lifetime. Yeah. If people are, like you know, kind of clueless, the Republican Party and other people are just like, yeah, we're the majority. It's like, "Mm, Mm -hmm. I'm going to check those statistics. I don't think you're the majority. We're already the majority of the population in California, correct? Of course. Like I think um, our representation and as we continue pushing forward, it's really important. Um, uh, If you think about it, like the major CIOs of companies, Cisco, Mm -hmm. Facebook, and Hewlett Packard are all uh, Latino. They're yeah. all CIOs, so they have the data. <laughs> yeah. They know. And so also, like, a, like, this whole, like, if you look at millennials, are you a millennial or are you Gen X like yeah. me? No, I'm Gen X. You're Gen X. But if you look at millennials, like, when we were growing up as Gen X, yeah. 
it was like, oh, you're dating somebody from another ethnicity. Yeah. That was notable. Not like crazy notable, but like, oh, <laughs> you're different ethnicities. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. And for millennials, they're just like, they're already, they're typically, like my daughter is Korean, Greek, Swedish, and Irish. I mean, four different nationalities. Yeah. Like all of our kids are going to, and then her kids will wind up being yeah. nine or eight or six different nationalities. It's yeah. all blurring into. Yeah, there's not going to be a, a solution that needed. A typical will probably evolve more into how do people want to be hired? How do right. people want to look for jobs? Everything's going to be automated. Like, yeah. give me a job. Don't make me search for one. <laughs> yeah, I so, like that. So, yes. So I, think, I think that's one of the things you're going to have to contend with is I think you're right now. You're going to get a lot of leads because you can solve this yeah, problem. This problem, but the software is going to have to just solve the general problem of qualified people. Yes. Right. So, but you're aware of that, obviously. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right, everybody, go okay. uh, check out Atypica. Go do a trial. If you're hearing my voice, yes. no company's too small, no company's too large to go try Atypica. Yeah. Give it a try. Maybe it helps you, and if it helps you, maybe you write a check for ten, twenty dimes. <laughs> And uh, this company gets really big. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Laura. Really thank you for being here. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.